Hello and welcome to the next episode of Cylinder Radio. I'm your host, Will Roosh, high school teacher that is now teaching from home because of this coronavirus. And, um, and today my guest is Jay Dyer. He is an author, YouTuber, TV host, comedian, hard guy to box in. I seem to get a lot of guests who are kind of hard to, to kind of label easily, um, but very, very interesting guy. I'm interested in, in just breaking stuff down with him because I think he's really smart and I think we can um, you know, play with some ideas. And the topic, the cylinder for today is gonna be conspiracy theories. Uh, I think that there's a, an element of the current events that can tap into this. There's factions of society that, that believe conspiracy theories and we're gonna kind of break down the why. So Jay, thank you for, for coming on the show and can you introduce yourself to the audience who might not be familiar? Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I do jaysanalysis.com, which is just a website where I kind of funnel all my different opinions and ideas, essays, videos that deal with philosophy, film, geopolitics, theology. We do uh, a lot of debates. We do a lot of uh, comedic stuff. We did uh, a TV show based on my first book, one full season, the full production TV show. And then we do all kinds of stuff. So I have a pretty active, fairly good sized discord. A lot of people in there who are interested in uh, philosophy, theology debates. Um, we have, we have all kinds of stuff going on that I'm involved in a lot of, we got my hands in a lot of fires, but yeah. Um, yeah so I, I, I wrote uh, two books on Hollywood and symbolism and psychological warfare, um, a, a philosophy major a degree in philosophy. And that's, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Now my, my, my days are, are spent pretty much focusing on the YouTube channel. So. Yeah. So are you, are you pretty independent then as far as like, you don't have a boss that you have to. Like, answer yeah. To? I took, I took my, what I do full time about three or four years ago. So I've been doing what I do full time. I quit my job back then started doing this full time. The reason I asked that is that frees up. Um, the stuff we're going to talk about, you know, is obviously controversial. And if, and if there's certain, um, you know, elements at play that uh, want to keep information from getting out, well, that, that you know, runs through a, a, a hierarchy within structures. And if you are independent, then you're basically not bound by those structures. That's true. Um... I, I function a lot better in that kind of an atmosphere. I've never done well with, uh, you know, bosses breathing on my shoulder, bitching and yelling at me. So I always lasted very briefly in those kinds of jobs. So I finally got the gumption uh, four years ago to strike out and try to do it on my own. Uh, it's been a, a, a kind of a snowball. It's grown from just blogging to doing a lot of podcasts. And then we grew to doing a lot of videos. Then we did two books. So it's really picked up. Um, and I function a lot better in that vein of doing it, just my personality, but it's not for everybody. It requires a lot of uh, uh, time and attention. Basically my whole, I actually work more uh, being my own boss than yeah. if I had a boss. So sometimes I actually miss the, I, 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 would, I wouldn't change it for the world, but I miss the time when I had like time off because I don't have time off. If you're your own boss, you, you, there's no such thing as time off anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's an entrepreneurship thing. My wife is an entrepreneur and she, you know, this is that classic, you'll work 80 hours for less pay than you would, you know, but, but, you know, you do have a boss and that's your, your customers. I mean, essentially your, your right. boss, for lack of a better term, are the people who follow what you do and you answer to them because if you don't bring quality stuff to them, then you won't be able to provide for yourself. So, yeah. you know, yeah, being your own boss is, is tricky, but it does allow freedom if you want to just run then you're able to do that. And um, yeah, so that, that makes a difference. So to start off talking about conspiracy theories, uh, there's a, I think it's probably like Michael Shermer or someone like that from Skeptic Magazine. You know, someone said this joke where a guy dies and like, um, you know, St. Peter at the gates is like, so, uh, or no, or God, you know, shows up. So I'm messing up the joke already. But a guy dies, then God comes down and says, you know, Thank I'll God. tell you anything you want to hear. <laughs> And, uh, and, the, and the guy says, uh, I'll answer any question for you. And the guy says, okay, who killed Kennedy? And God says, it was Lee Harvey Oswald. And he did it with his bolt action rifle from the book depository. And the guy paused and goes, hmm, this goes up higher than I thought. 
you know, and I just kind of screwed up the joke, but essentially this, this concept of when people have conspiracy theories, they are deeply locked in and committed to them. Um, I'm guessing it has something to do with trying to make, make sense of the world, which is obviously very confusing and find meaning and just get it, getting some sort of like, you know, some sort of anchor in reality um, to uh, explaining why crazy things happen the way that they do. But what's your take on, on conspiracy theories and why they exist and why certain people buy into them more than others and things like that? That's a great question. And I like the way you framed it with uh, the way that we tend to latch on to beliefs and structures for interpreting the world. So you might think that, for example, um, if I do a lot of debates with atheists or, or apologetic type debates, that that would be divorced from conspiracy theories or worldviews or uh, uh, the way people interpret the world. And actually, it's not. There's a really close correlation between um, the way that we understand the world, whether it's from our religious paradigms or through our, you know, scheme of how we interpret history and events in history there in my in my view i come from a school of philosophy where everything is interpreted through a kind of schema or you could say rose-colored glasses so we all have a a presupposition that we come from to interpret the world and that's going to be in any area of life and so it's true that people uh latch on to conspiracies sometimes that are irrational but we also have to recognize that sometimes conspiracies are true so it doesn't, it's not really helpful necessarily. I'm not talking about you, but just in general, people like Shermer, the, the, the sort of the skeptic mindset, it's not really that helpful to just picture everything as uh, theory because there's no such thing as a purely neutral um, theory less position that you can take that's privileged because everybody has some kind of theory. Everybody has some kind of paradigm. So when we talk about conspiracy theories, this is, is pretty nuanced and, and I, everybody goes through a kind of a process when you first kind of wake up to this kind of stuff, you, you are a little more gullible because you haven't been duped. You haven't fallen into stupid conspiracies and mistakes yet, but after a while you do, and then you kind of, hopefully you get better at your skills of analysis and you don't fall into the traps. Um, and, and you don't think that, you know, aliens are uh, about to land and get you and all this kind of nonsense based on YouTube videos. Some people still are stuck in that phase. I don't know, but um, there's a there's a natural prog uh, progress to this, and so ironically, in my own situation, I moved from I think I was awakened to conspiracies when I was about 19, so that's about 20 21 years ago, and I immediately decided to take more of an academic approach to these questions. So when I went into university, you if you progress and if you get into conspiracy stuff, you'll immediately start dealing with things like intelligence agencies and who's doing this and who's behind this and who did this black op and what's this uh, fake flag operation. This So this leads you into the realm of geopolitics and espionage. <laughs> and so I started realizing, well, that's actually the academic route, the historical route for these questions. And so that's how I pursued it in a more serious way. And you come to realize that, oh, it's not so much that uh, if you want to frame it as conspiracies, you can, but if you think about it in terms of, espionage and geopolitics this is the norm of all history yeah. all of history is governments engaging a subterfuge with different governments so for example if you read uh, machiavelli's book of uh, book art of war not sun tzu but machiavelli also wrote another book art of war he was known for the prince of course but his other book art of war there's a, if you read book six of art of the art of war it's nothing but tricks fake flag operations that you could do uh, ways to mess up your enemy all kinds of deceptions, right? So that's one of the most famous texts on warfare, and it's nothing but, quote, conspiracies. And so when you start researching military history and this kind of stuff and, and operations that were done in wartime, you start to realize that this is a lot more common than most people think. So it really depends on how we frame or understand conspiracies. Um, if we mean YouTube videos with grainy uh, discs floating in the sky that are obviously screenshots from Independence Day, <laughs> yeah. that's not a good argument. That's not a good uh, forensic uh, case for a conspiracy. If we mean things like Gulf of Tonkin, uh, uh, USS uh, Liberty, these kinds of things, those are real questions that, that have to be asked. And we can look at those events. We can look at prior events. Again, norm it's normative in warfare for there to be large scale deceptions. <laughs> that's a great point like lumping in you know like operation northwoods you know yeah. which was this concept that we we're uh, going to i was like pushed on on 
President Kennedy, I believe, that this idea that we're going to attack American um, institutions and say it was the Cubans as an excuse to get into Cuba. And we never did it, but that was like a legitimate proposal. Um, you know, the Operation Paperclip bringing over a bunch of Nazis, you know, to work on our rockets and stuff like that. Like lumping those kinds of things in that Gulf of Tonkin, that actually happened with Flat Earth and with a lot of other things. That's where it gets confusing. Yeah. Like, how are we going to define this idea of conspiracy theories is a great point because we we have to like maybe separate them between flat earth is a very different thing than how do we you know protect people get what we need get the resources we need on a, in a you know a global scale and things along those lines i mean I, would you agree that that's that's so like an important i don't know how how to separate them i don't know how to do that but that seems like something that needs to get done that not all theories are created equal essentially yeah so uh if you're in the domain of looking at paradigms or worldviews as a whole uh or if you're talking about specific instances in history it, there's no easy answers i mean i don't have any set view on for example jfk i mean i don't believe the, the official classic history of jfk i think that's that's false um, but I don't pretend then to know specifically all the different details. I got a bunch of JFK theory books, but I think that it's similar in these kinds of big events where we can have a kind of a overall, um, idea of the inconsistencies in the story. If we want to play detective. We can look at the things that don't add up in the story. That doesn't necessarily tell us who was behind every single detail and event. I think we can, get, we can again, form kind of general ideas based on things like the project for a new american century that kind of stuff but um it still doesn't tell us every specific but a, a police officer or a detective doesn't know every specific when they investigate these kinds of things they do they piece together what looks to be the case and so we're, we all do that and so of course i recognize the ambiguity of history um but the the, the sort of uh, uh trademark skeptic groups like Shermer and that kind of, those kind of people, they actually have a more dogmatic uh, commitment to establishment theories than they actually do to the evidence. Because what's at root here, whether it's the big events or whether it's our worldviews or our, our paradigms in relationship to God or what exists, what doesn't exist, these kinds of big metaphysical questions, at root here is, again, paradigms and how we read the world through the lenses that we have right and so since everybody has those if you read a book like structures of scientific revolution by thomas kuhn he shows that at no point in history did a scientific revolution occur just on the basis of oh let's all get together and look at the evidence and then we will all come away with the obvious conclusion because if we look at the lady holding the scales if we just put the facts on which side and then, and the scales will a tilt. That's not how it works. People don't work that way because that completely ignores how humans interpret and interact in the world. Humans don't want to be wrong. People don't just give up their, their uh, assumptions just because they're wrong. They have all kinds of biases. They have all kinds of uh, ulterior motives. Uh, you know, people who work in science, they want to get funding, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's motivations that are there. And again, I'm not denying science. I'm just saying that it's naive to think that everybody operates on the basis of just looking at brute facts tabulating up the number of percentile percentages of the evidence and then therefore we'll we'll pick that one because it has 67 percent uh, of evidence over against i mean this is another problem in philosophy it's called the underdetermination of data where you can't just look at different models of data and know which theory is correct because you might have two three or four or five a hundred theories that actually can fit different data so where we as philosophers actually look at things at a more fundamental level so whether it's big events and, and conspiracies, quote unquote, or whether it's your paradigm, the, the recurring problem here in both of these examples is how do we understand human being, uh, the human being's interpretation of the world? And can we have certitude and can we have a way to judge between different models? And the strength of the school of philosophy that I come from is that we argue, yes, we think that there is a way. So even contrary to, to Thomas, Thomas Kuhn himself, who thought that there was no way to compare different paradigms, we would actually argue that you can compare paradigms and you can show that certain paradigms are more, uh, not just more rational, but even 
pre-rational and even necessary. Because if, if you have a worldview, for example, that totally undercuts the possibility of reasoning at all, then your worldview is not true. <laughs> because if you start reasoning by that very action, you're disproving the, the, the most fundamental uh, pre-commitments in your worldview. So therefore, which worldview can give a better account, a better coherence view uh, of truth, of knowledge, of reality, et cetera. So that's the strength of transcendental arguments and presuppositional philosophy. It doesn't necessarily tell you in every uh, specific, however, which theory or analysis might be true. So uh, does a presuppositional apologist know uh, like by osmosis whether 9-11 occurred according to this thing or that thing? No, it's not gonna tell you in every specific, some magical way to know uh, apart from you know empirical evidence sure but uh, when it comes to comparing paradigms themselves more basic questions yes you do have a better approach i think so that was kind of a long-winded way to answer the question and just to point out that um, we don't live in the world of what's called naive empiricism this is the the attitude that uh, developed out of the enlightenment um, and that's kind of been debunked for many centuries but what you get in people like Shermer or a lot of the modern day pop atheist apologists is you get this kind of rehashing of the uh, uh, older, uh, you know, enlightenment era paradigms that most people don't even believe anymore, but they just kind of rehash it. But to be fair to them, the people who argue for theism, they just rehash 1700s era arguments too. Uh, just a lot of times based on ignorance. So we've got two people clashing together, these uh, modern sort of so-called theists. And then we've got the, modern atheists and they just kind of fight each other over arguments from from 400 years ago which is silly but the point i'm making is just simply that whether it's theism or whether it's big conspiracy events there are more fundamental philosophical problems that i think have to be addressed uh before we can build a worldview build a consistent approach to interpreting the world yeah well th i mean there's so much there that you know i i think that when I read Jonathan Haidt's book, um, it really, it, uh, The Righteous Mind, it kind of broke, it showed me a little bit of like how you're, you're kind of programmed to see things differently. You have these specific lenses, um, mm -hmm. psychological temperament and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he used some, an example in the book, because even when you say like, let's look at data, you know, and I've had, um, I had Peter Bogosian on the, on the show and, you know, I love the stuff that he's done and Sam Harris and Michael Sherman. I think they they bring a lot of value to mm -hmm. what they're doing, but I, I, I hear your, your perspective on this of like, even if you're just basing everything on data, the data is so easily corrupted. And that's part of why Peter Bogosian is going after like the, the social justice stuff is he's like, you, we need the best data possible. But Jonathan Haidt had to, a cool like hypothetical where and there's a peer review coming up on a on a on data that says that like uh on a, on a you know some sort of experiment that showed that caffeine causes breast cancer then female coffee drinkers are going to be very they're going to scrutinize that data to make sure that it's not true but a male who doesn't drink coffee is just going to be like yeah it seems to check out like how we even get good data is is so tricky and and even with Michael Shermer talking about like how he just, you know, needs to, you know, nothing. He's not going to have like faith on anything. Going to be a skeptic, skeptic magazine, skeptic about everything is you can become blinded to things. And I went through this just this week because, um, you know, cylinder radio heterodox Academy guy. And I don't like criticizing Trump because it's so easy that I always give him the benefit of the doubt. And when he was giving his press conference, one of the press conferences and he was just handling it so poorly it i realized that i i was really ignorant to how poorly he was handling it until it got like way obvious that like he was doing handling it poorly and then i was like wow like me trying to be balanced and trying to be reasonable has actually made me blind to it and i think that can apply to what we're discussing here with whether it comes to faith or when it whether it comes to conspiracy theories is you can be so like focused on on being like balanced or being like based on yes. fact that you can ignore something right in front of you let's do yeah I, that makes me think of two examples that we've been kind of noticing lately me and my friends um 
So let's give two, uh, uh, two fallacies that are exemplified in exactly what you're talking about. So on the side of people like Michael Shermer, uh, there could be the fallacy of what's called the fallacy fallacy. And this is the idea that because something is argued poorly, that therefore uh, the position is false. Okay. Well, just because a position is argued poorly, it should be pretty obvious. It's a non sequitur to argue that therefore it's false. I mean, if I, if I start arguing on the basis, I say, oh, uh, two plus two equals four because Bill Cosby told me, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he, 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 he drugged me when he, when he told me that. And when I, when I woke up, he told me, no, I'm joking. Um, that would be a bad argument, right? But that doesn't mean that two plus two doesn't equals four, right? So sometimes in the, in the Shermer department, you could see that kind of a fallacy. Um, and again, I would stress also that I think if I was, if I was to debate Michael Shermer, uh, I would point out issues related to naive empiricism and those kinds of traditional commitments that he has to that older enlightenment worldview that I think has been debunked, especially if you follow somebody like David Hume. I mean, David Hume is great for our side because he's the consistent guy who's followed through that skepticism and pointed out that if skepticism is true, uh, you have to really kind of admit you don't know anything. And so you don't actually have access to these things like reason and logic and these objective things that you think. And if you watch my debate with Matt Dillahunty, I just keep sort of reiterating that point because from my vantage point in the debate, I don't think Matt ever got that. And he just kept saying things like, well, logic just is. It just is, which is ad hoc. Now, to be fair, though, uh, having been in the world of conspiracies for a long time and analyzing it and, and watching and analyzing media and how people adopt views, I will say that one of the most common uh, uh, fallacies in the conspiracy world is Texas sharpshooter. So this is the idea where you will, if you see a cluster of data, you will, because of your pre-commitment, you will adopt a specific interpretation or a, or cherry pick a specific interpretation of, of a data cluster to fit the narrative that you have. So then everything that occurs suddenly starts to be part of this grand conspiracy, which is not necessarily true. So uh, a great example of this would be sort of, uh, I don't mean to pick on these people, but they get on my nerves because I, they, they'll always kind of pop up here and there. But uh, have, you, have, you, have you heard of the targeted individual? I have not, no. Okay, so this is a field of conspiracy people who think that they specifically are pointed out and targeted by the government. And so it verges at times, and I'm not trying to be mean to people, but it verges at times on a kind of paranoid schizophrenia where they think that every event that's happening, right, is kind of like done to mess with them and that they're the subject of a vast kind of Truman Show conspiracy, right? And so like if the neighbor is uh, suddenly mowing his lawn at, at four in the morning for whatever odd reasons, because your neighbor's insane, maybe you just have a crazy neighbor. Oh no, he's mowing his lawn to mess with me and to keep me up to drive me crazy. So there's a it's lot of doc narcissistic, doesn't it, Jay? I mean, it is very narcissistic. I mean, there is a weird, we actually, we had a good discussion about this recently in the discord that uh, there is a kind of interesting mm, sort of God complex, like the whole world revolves around me in the, the, the weird targeted individual world. So, so, uh, so if I were Michael Shermer and I was watching those kind of people, I would obviously think that kind of stuff. And I was just trying to, that this is, this is some kind of weird narcissistic, uh, um, if this person feels like they don't have power in their life, that they then need to come up with a grand narrative to give their life meaning, to give themselves power, right? Right. Anyway, but uh, I was just using it as an example of Texas Sharpshooter where, so they will do something like, um, have there ever been people who were, uh, you know, messed with by a tyrannical government or experimented on. Yes, that has happened verifiably. So therefore that must be happening to me, right? Because I picked out these instances in the data of history where it's happened. It must be happening to me. Then every event is interpreted to mean that, right? Oh, I'm standing at the grocery store and like the person in front of me uh, is, is keeps adding items. So, to, so I'm being held up in line even longer. Uh, they're doing that to me on purpose, right? It's just, it's just, it's just madness. But there is ironically a kind of logic to that madness that exemplifies that fallacy. So we have to be careful because any of these positions that we adopt can become, as you pointed out, a dogmatic position to where even if you're Michael Shermer, everything is somehow you're, you think you're skeptical of it, but you're actually a dogmatic skeptic. And that's actually an irrational position. Yeah. Did you ever see the, the website Spurious Correlation? 
I did. That's another it, great example. It's yeah. great. I mean, it's like it's like um, Nicholas Cage movies. Yeah, the Nick Cage and- films. Nick Cage films. Yeah. yeah so so oh, every time. Con- <laughs> what, what, what was it like swimming pool deaths or something like that yeah, yeah. This is, it's like it's like two things that, and the, they they align so well because the first i guess the one of the first rules in social science is correlation does not equal causation but right. yet we do it all the time and yeah, thank you that's actually a better example you're right i should have used correlation causation because that's probably that's even more prominent in conspiracy circles than texas sharpshooter but they're related yeah <laughs> yeah um so and part of this also is people don't like not knowing things. Like if you ever watch like Jimmy Kimmel, Lie Witness News, he just goes out and makes stuff up and people on the street are like, it's hard. For, like even when you say like- Did you ever consider player, the possibility, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah. It just occurred to me. Did you ever yeah. consider the possibility that the Nicolas Cage is going around and drowning people in swimming pools? Yes. Did you ever I consider that that's what's happening? <laughs> yeah. So maybe there, uh, maybe there is a correlation and a causation. I'm done. What if it? Well, I mean, it'd be perfect. He could do it and just and just say like, "Hey, well, I, the data was there. He should have found me earlier." <laughs> um, the uh, like you know, people like even when you say, "Are you familiar with the Texas sharpshooter or like or the the um, paranoid? What was it? The the man of uh, targeted man, targeted like, individuals." Yeah, I'm trying to run this this podcast like I know what I'm talking about and I'm well researched. So even then, I'm like, "Oh no, I don't know. Is that something that I should know?" You know, like it's hard to admit when you don't know something, especially in the world that you're supposed to. I'm a history teacher. You bring up something in history and I don't know it. It's like, oh no, I'm a failure. And then you have like imposter syndrome and all this kind of stuff. So people want to know things and they don't like the uncertainty. Right. Um, there's a couple that I want to just point out and get your thoughts on. So Eric Weinstein did an awesome breakdown of his take on the um, Jeffrey Epstein case on his podcast, The Portal, and it was really good. And he had personal interactions with Jeffrey Epstein. And, and that's, I think, one that I don't want to rehash what, what he talked about because um, he has personal interactions and stuff. But, um, but this seems like one. I mean, I want to get your take on it, but it seems like one that's very obvious that there's some shenanigans, let's say. Um, there's something going on here with this guy being very powerful, no one knowing where his money came from. He died. It's out of the news cycle. News stories were buried. Like there's, it's so big. It's become a meme just to keep it in the common, you know, like vernacular, but the, but what's, what's your take on that? Is that like, that's like a pretty big conspiracy theory that's going on, you know, I guess for the past couple of months, what are your, what's your take on that? Um, my take on it is uh, to look at previous similar situations. Um, I just did an interview with a friend of mine who's a, a Russia analyst, and he was doing an analysis of the history of the figure of Robert Maxwell during the Cold War. And Maxwell is a really fascinating character because he seemed to kind of play both sides of the East-West dialectic during the Cold War. So he would have interactions with um, the Soviets and try to kind of play them and he would have interactions with uh, British intelligence and try to play them as well. And Maxwell, of course, met a, a ominous fate. Um, and there's different speculations as to what happened to his death. But of course, his daughter is Ghislaine Maxwell. So uh, I think we can see precedents for this uh, with Robert, given the fact that he was a media baron, uh, intelligence asset, uh, operative, um, was doing all kinds of crazy stuff that most likely included uh, compromise operations. Um, so when you look at it from that perspective, uh, I don't think, in, I mean, none of that's really conspiracy theory. That's pretty much just kind of mainline intelligence research history. If you look at uh, the Franklin cover up with Craig Spence and that kind of stuff with uh, Nick Bryant's book and uh, the other Franklin scandal book that escapes me at the moment, but so those are some uh, uh, um, previous types of situations like this. And ironically, uh, you know, I kind of stumbled into that view of stuff from the movie world, right? So when I was writing my book on Hollywood and I was, uh, I, the first kind of film symbolism analysis that I did that I put in the book was Eyes Wide Shut by Kubrick. Um, and I, I posited uh, 10 years ago that maybe Kubrick was telling us that this is kind of the way the, the, the very, very wealthy people will compromise people. They'll kind of get them in, lure them in, 
and you kind of have these operations where you where where you've uh, you know got blackmail dirt on people. Yeah. So I was aware, made aware of this. I met some people who did a lot of research and analysts analysis in those in those types of fields um, over the, the last decade. Uh, I did a bunch of research in relationship to the Roman Catholic Church and their scandals that are very similar um, to that kind of stuff, these kind of sexual blackmail operations. And then my publisher uh, put out, do you remember uh, Deborah Jean? Wait, no, I don't, he may not have done, I think he did. I don't know, maybe not. I don't know. But so there's two different madams. There's Deborah Jean Palfrey, who was the, uh, uh, the DC madam. And then there's Henry Vinson. Who's another yeah, Heidi madam. Flats, the thing is something else. Okay. So these these are two famous madams who uh, talked about their operations that they ran with their whorehouses, basically. Yeah. And that that a lot of it was involving a lot of dirt on very powerful politicians. So that was in the realm of politics, um, and it looks like the 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 Epstein situation was very similar to that. So uh, that's my take on it. That's always been what my take was. Um, I didn't know about Epstein, you know, himself until. I think the first time I saw about that was uh, Ben Swan had done a report on the uh, Lolita airline and, and Clinton and different people having been on that. I think he reported on that in 2016 or 17. So I didn't know about Epstein per se, but I had known about these other examples. So that's always been how I've interpreted this case. So it almost doesn't seem like you don't see this as this, like him, if Epstein was some guy that was working for, you know, like very powerful people or some sort of intelligence agency to capture powerful people in, in uh, tough circumstances and have some proof of that so that they can use them to their satisfy their ends or whatever it might be. That's not, that's not that crazy. Like that's happened a lot of times throughout history. That's not, you know, honeypot or whatever you want to call it. Like that's not that absurd of a concept. But now, because you say that he committed suicide, and there's no real proof of that. And, you know, it just seems like he had a bunch of names and then he's killed. Like, it just, the like covering that up is like is where it gets, it just starts to reveal, especially in the modern day, because we have internet and we can spread memes about how Jeffrey Epstein right. hang himself and stuff. Is now it's just highlighting what seems to be, it wouldn't have been that absurd, but. They're still trying to keep up the front, like this kind of stuff never happens. But like you said, like if you just read some books, you can clearly see, you learn history, you can clearly see this stuff happens all the time. Yeah, I mean, the second old, what's the second oldest profession? It's it's espionage, right? After prostitution. So uh, yeah, I mean, this is just the modus operandi of states from all history that we know. So yeah, uh, when you do know history, you don't, you're not surprised about any of this stuff. It's very kind of obvious, I think. But again, exactly what happened in the case of uh, his death, I have no idea. And I don't, I don't claim to know. I mean, right. I've seen all the different theories, um, but I don't have any, you know, insight on exactly what went down. And I think a lot of times in these cases, I'll, I'll say this. So when I first, just like I was saying earlier about kind of the process that you go through when you kind of wake up to get woke to the way the world really works and this kind of stuff, you kind of initially assume that you got it all figured out. And then as you learn more, um, as you study history, as you study these topics, you more and more realize how sophisticated and difficult it is to actually know specifically in every case what went down. So you can kind of have general theories. Um, but I will say that I've become more and more of a skeptic in the sense of the conspiracy world. Not that I don't think there's conspiracy, absolutely, absolutely do. But what I'm getting at is that you learn the complexity of these things and that it's not as easy to peg black and white, good guy, bad guy, as I thought back when I was you know, 23 and I was reading conspiracy stuff. Well, now that I'm 40 and I read these kinds of things, I think there's a lot more nuance. Um, and I don't claim to know, right? So like with, with the big nine event, I don't claim to know exactly what went down, but I definitely do not believe the, the official story. So I think that's a much safer approach. Um, a, lot, a lot of people get mad at me too, because they assume they know what my positions are. So for example, if I critique, we did a, in that, that interview that I did with my friend who's in Russia analyst, we did a critique of uh, some of the CIA defectors. Mm -hmm. Because what happens if you defect is that you'll then put out the information that the CIA wants you to put out. So people assumed that that meant that I was defending the Soviets. Well, that's a di false dialectic. I don't care for either Sovietism or uh, Western crony capitalism, either one. 
right? So to assume that because I criticized the you know, Yuri Bezmenov and these kind of uh, defectors, that doesn't mean that I think, oh, I'm a, I love Stalin secretly. Like I got you know little Stalin icons secretly hit, you know hidden in my shrine somewhere. That's just ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I can I can believe that two different positions are um, both bad uh, uh, and have their flaws, um, and debate that out and without falling into the either or fallacy. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can, you know, I think like, why not just like, you know, entertain ideas, take the best information and be open to the fact that you could be well, wrong. Let me add to that because that's another thing that comes up in conspiracies. And by the way, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but if you study psychological warfare, you, you, you'll realize and you'll learn that a lot of times there are fake conspiracies that are put out on purpose. Mm -hmm. And this is called disinformation. Right? So if you just look at disinformation as a kind of fake conspiracy, look at the last few years of Russia Gate, right? Russia Gate was a gigantic, we said all along that it was not, it was a bunch of nonsense, nothing burger. And that has been completely vindicated. I said that back in 2016, I made two or three videos calling it a, a bunch of nonsense. And then just yesterday or the day before, uh, the last remaining remnants of this so-called Russia collusion accusation with the troll farms, the Russian companies that were the troll farms, they, the feds have dropped that case. So now there's literally like, to my knowledge, nothing left, even left in the, the whole uh, Russia accusation um, phenomenon. Uh, but yet that was hyped up in the media to be this, just this giant thing. And I, I don't personally, I don't really care about Trump either way. Um, I don't hate Trump. I don't love Trump. I'm kind of, I just observe it because as you get older, uh, in, at least in my case, I've gotten less and less interested in sort of the day-to-day -day political circus. I find geopolitics very fascinating, but on a day-to-day, -day, I, I just don't really follow the, I don't have time. I don't really have the interest or the time to follow, you know, every single daily drama between Bernie and Biden. And all, it's just, it just gets really old. So um, yeah, it really is. I mean, and people that's, I mean, this election, I mean, it's the, and the lead up to it, it just, it feels very much like a soap opera. Like how much is the president really influencing your life? You know, I mean, I had students who were just, you know, crying, bawling when, when Trump was elected. I was like, what do you think is going to happen? How is this going to negatively affect Yeah, you? I mean, on your day to day, yeah. the image, yeah. you know, it's the image of this guy is what is, it's a, it's all emotional. It's an emotional attachment to this. this person. Exactly. And as you get older too, you real, after you've been through a bunch of elections and election cycles, you realize that like the day to day pretty much continues on and the overall agenda of where things are intended to go, that kind of continues on. But who's in the, the, the office of the presidency really doesn't do much other than just give people something to yap about around the water cooler. Yeah. So I want to, I want to talk about two things. One is that you're very familiar with is Hollywood and where Hollywood kind of plays a role in people's you know uh people buying into the narrative that there is you know a puppet master and all that kind of stuff um it's a very powerful entity uh, and then i want to talk about the coronavirus before we go but um but it's how hollywood is a very powerful entity in that you know we believe what we believe based on what we are told and you know this idea that hollywood has a specific agenda i think that's there's a good there's a good foundation to that and mm -hmm. what is that agenda do they mean well and they're trying to i mean i think i think that people mean well and i think that people want to promote good ideas and they think that they have good ideas so they're going to make tell a good story stories are so powerful that you tell a good story people get behind it there was one turtle that was found with that straw up its nose off the coast of costa rica and we banned straws because of it like that's, I mean, th that's one story of that poor turtle is, is, is changing people's lives and something. I'm not saying, you know, whatever, pasta strip banning that's like necessarily a bad idea. But Why that, do you hate turtles? I know. I'm just like, I hate paper straws. That's what I hate. <laughs> um, well, I'm saying if you don't, if you, if you, if you don't. If you don't, then yeah, exactly. You hate so, turtles, so, how do you think that it, do you think that that's what it is do you think that it is that hollywood means the people in hollywood mean well they're the people who get into you know storytelling for a living you know are very emotional very empathetic people and then they try to promote their best ideas through story and then and then in doing that they might have unintended consequences i don't know like what's your what's your take on how hollywood plays a role in this whole thing yeah, that's a great question. And I always try to be very clear about being nuanced and layered on this question because um, I was debating a, uh, 
there was an atheist guy who came on to debate me on this. Uh, actually, he's got he's grown to be a pretty big YouTuber. Uh, Mr. Atheist and I actually had a debate a couple of years ago on on this topic because he thought that that I said something like that the entire all of Hollywood is one giant pyramid of Illuminati and. He didn't even know what my book was about. And I was like, well, dude, I was in a documentary with Oliver Stone. I was like, I don't think, uh, you know, they would have put me in that documentary if I was like just some lunatic. Oh, I didn't know that. So he didn't realize that my book was actually written in, in more of an academic way. Right. Because I titled it in a, in a sneaky way. I, I titled it something really pop, you know, like, uh, uh, like titillating, right? So it's, it's esoteric Hollywood, sex, cults, and symbols in film. Right. And I've got like eyes wide shut type stuff right, right. Uh, signified there. So it has this kind of titillating uh, sensational title. But when you get into it, it's got like 500, 400 footnotes, something crazy like that. So it's very, you know, I, I took a really scholarly approach. And uh, the point I'm trying to make is that we have to be careful not to, to lump everybody into one vast conspiracy because there's different layers of power structure. There's different layers of wealth, obviously. I mean, obviously a guy who has a billion dollars is more powerful than a guy with a million dollars, right? So that alone should show us that not everybody's necessarily at the same tier. Um, you know, there are people obviously who want to do genuine artwork, who have made uh, powerful films that make it, have a great message. Um, so not everybody is part of a vast conspiracy. Um, I would say most of that type of stuff that we when we think of quote conspiracy level of Hollywood, that's at really the highest, highest levels. Um, there's plenty of examples though, where we can verify this kind of coordination. So if we look at people like George Clooney, if we look at people like Ben Affleck, we look at people like um, Angelina Jolie, they are directly tied to very high level uh, think tank government entities, right? The United Nations, the CFR, um, so really that's not even in question. Um, people like Jennifer Garner have gone from alias to openly working with the CIA. So what I found when I was doing like my, my grad work on this was that there's oh, a lot I, more, sorry, there's a lot I, more. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Like I don't, I'm not familiar with the Jennifer Garner thing. So I think that's an example where like, like when, when you say she works for the CIA, like what is that? Can you just like explain that to? Right, so there's a academic book that's great on this topic, which kind of helped, I, I used it when I was writing mine. Uh, it's called Trisha, it's a CIA in Hollywood by Trisha Jenkins. She's a PhD at University of Texas, or I don't know where she's at, right. but Austin or something, but it's a well-known book. There's another book called Operation Hollywood, um, which is uh, deals with similar topics. The only reason I bring those up is just to point out that uh, that book discussed how the CIA consulted on Alias. And then after Jennifer Garner left Alias, she went into doing public PR work for the CIA. Uh, so I, I'm not make saying that she, like a good to make them seem like a good um, organization or to promote a specific agenda. Like that's what I'm just, well, uh, her videos and that kind of stuff was more toward geared towards recruitment. So she would go out and do presentations and this kind of stuff. Um, and then interestingly, Ben Affleck uh, himself, made the point in an interview that that look a, a large portion of the CIA or of Hollywood is involved with the CIA more than you would think that's in a famous I think it's either a telegraph or a guardian interview I've, I've cited that in many uh, many lectures that I've done but the point is just to say that um, yeah if you want specifics I can give you many many specifics the easiest way to verify that this is true is there was a FOIA re uh, release last year I cited at the beginning of my second book that dealt with uh, Pentagon and, and, and um, the different agencies put allocating a lot of money to having messages inserted into, I think something like, th it's thousands, it's in the thousands of films. I can look and see what the specific number is. So I'm just saying that, I'm, what I'm saying is that there's different levels. It's not like there's only, there's one guy in an underground base who's telling everybody, oh, you'll put him in that movie, you'll put him in that movie. <laughs> Uh, it's not like that. It's what's more the like reason why they would be doing this. Well, what's the? I mean, Edward Bernays, the father of uh, propaganda, uh, promote to promote like is it something to promote like economic um, economic strength in America? Is it to promote to keep people quiet? Is it like I guess? No, I guess no, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's not yeah. either or. There's uh, there's there's multiple different motives and and reasons and shape the pocket all it's all the above right so um for example a, a, a blockbuster 
that's way more important if a potentially say 500 million people will see the new James Bond movie. That's way more important than some independent film that, that, you know, 50,000 people are going to watch. Right. Uh, so, so again, I'm not trying to paint this as one vast thing. There's a lot of, of layers and a lot of nuance here. So you can have, let's go back to the beginning of the camera. When they invented the camera, they realized how useful it would be for propaganda. So some of the earliest stuff that was filmed was war propaganda. So the beginning of movies comes out of like people figuring out, hey, let's make some war propaganda here, right? First big blockbusters, uh, uh, Hell's Angels, which is a, uh, a Howard Hughes film. Um, that is a giant war propaganda film, right? So if you've seen The Aviator, Martin Scorsese, then you re you'll remember that Howard Hughes, the Leonardo DiCaprio character, was like doing these giant Hollywood movies, right? Um, that was true back in the 20s when he was doing that. So if we, if we move- Top if Gun we, too, right? Top Gun was kind of like absolutely. that Absolutely, that was like, during the period- That was during the period- Fighter pilot. Yeah, yeah, that rec that recruitment film that actually my dad part part of the reason he joined the the Navy is because he watched Top Gun. That was during the period of the '80s when Reagan allocated a lot of money uh -huh. to um, those kinds of movies. Iron uh, Navy Seals with Charlie Sheen, yeah. Iron Eagle with uh, Lewis Gossett Jr. Yeah. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of those in the '80s. Um, that's another example. That's just at the level of like recruitment and and uh, propaganda. Again, if you get the book uh, Operation Hollywood, all that book is is like. 30 years of um, different consultation and alterations to scripts that the military Pentagon, these groups did. That's not even dealing with like the CIA level of stuff, right? Uh, just take the movie Zero Dark Thirty. That movie was basically made as a CIA film. I mean, that's openly the case, right? So some of the biggest directors, big, biggest people, Kathleen Kennedy, these kinds of people, uh, uh, James Cameron, um, if you read uh, Annie Jacobson's book on the history of DARPA, um, James Cameron's films have had this kind of consultation from DARPA, these kinds of people. So uh, again, I'm not trying to paint in an over, overly simplistic picture of everything being one giant conspiracy, but it would be very naive to think that all of these films don't have this, this kind of interconnection and consultation, which they absolutely do, that's been verified. There's at least, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's more now, but I mean, there's Milt Bearden, Chase Brandon, two former CIA operatives who consult on film. Um, if you book, get the book uh, uh, Denial and Deception by L Melissa Boyle Mela, she's a former CIA operative who trained Angelina Jolie, trained her for the movie Salt, right? That's another movie uh, it made in this vein. So what you, the more that you dig into this, the more you find it's, it's, it's flip sides of the same coin. Yeah. Um, just because uh, I do want to wrap up, uh, you know, five minutes or so, but the yeah. coronavirus is, uh, and I can talk to you forever. I just actually have like another appointment that I need to go to. Um, but because this is so interesting. And I, and I think that part of why, why this is a podcast, I try to keep it, you know, under an hour, but the, this is one where, you know, you, Jason, you're so nuanced. Because I think that that's part of what it is, is like nothing is simple when it comes to this, that right. in order for you to, to communicate your ideas, you can't say it simply because then those aren't going to be your ideas. Well, so, somebody will take that one phrase. And, oh, he said this. He said I know. This. I know. So I, I just wanted to apologize um, to, for, for, for kind of, you know, cutting you off. to. Well, that's okay. I understand. You got a time limit. That's fine. Yeah, but. but it, it, well, that's I, why I wrote a book. That's why I wrote books. So you can get my books. Yeah, more. and I want, I want people to, to, you know, follow what you're doing. And I think that hopefully this is just like giving people like, like, a, like a drug dealer, like get a little taste, you know, of, of this. And if, because if you're kind of triggered a little bit or turned on a little bit by like, oh, okay, there's nuance here. There's a lot of, you know, specifics that I want to dive down. I think that that's, that's, you know, something that I, that I want to encourage people to, to, to go into. Um, but this, the coronavirus, um, there, right now it seems like we're at this impasse between what's going to be worse for us, the virus or the economic downturn of people sitting at home doing nothing. Um, where does this fit into, so I'm hearing a lot of con conspiracy theories. So where does this fit into the topic by your estimation? No, it's just all great because for me now, you can all just go sit and watch my live streams and send me your Trump bucks. So when Trump sends you your $2,000 check, yeah. cash it, 
or uh, I'll also give you my Bitcoin wallet. Everybody can just watch my live streams. <laughs> like last night, I think I had like, like with, between last night and now like 8,000 on the, not a lot people watching live, but uh, <laughs> that's like my biggest live stream in within 16 hours have like seven or 8,000 people, which I, I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm at the same time, I'm being serious, tongue in cheek because it's like, well, now everybody's sitting at home. I guess this is great for live streamers, right? Like, yeah. like now we get a bigger audience, right? But uh, no, ser being more serious. Uh, yes, the, the bigger threat is I definitely think the uh, danger to the economy. Um, the If we overreact to this stuff, um, I do have my own opinions on the coronavirus. We actually did a three hour podcast with some pretty big directors. Uh, if you've never heard of uh, Aaron and Melissa Dykes, they did the pretty big film, uh, uh, Minds of Men, which is an excellent, excellent three hour, just totally documented analysis of the history of the MK Ultra um, uh, experiments and all that. Um, so they, they totally packed it with all the citations. It's not conspiracy per se. Uh, if you haven't seen Minds of Men, go watch it on YouTube. It's got, I don't know, two, three million views. Really good film. Um, so we did a, a, a three-hour podcast with them and some other friends of mine where we kind of just unloaded all of our data. And, and, and we all kind of came to the, the rough consensus that there does seem to be some shady uh, aspects to the origin of this. We do, uh, I would say that uh, the event 201 uh, could be relevant for this. If you're not familiar with that, you can look that up. Um, I would say the Nature article from 2015 about the uh, engineering of different kinds of uh, bio stuff. Uh, I don't know how. I, I'm, I was trying. I was having to censor and co talk in code on my YouTube channel last night, so I didn't get my, you know, so I didn't get my shit banned last night. So I'm trying to think how to talk in a, in a coded way. Um, but I definitely think I do. Th I think there's a real virus. Uh, I do think there's a real pneumonia. I've had pneumonia. I know what it's like. It's awful. Um, but I don't think it's uh, near as bad. I think it's being way overhyped. There is a real thing. There is a real danger. But um, ultimately, this fits into uh, an overall technocratic plan. So that I would be very leery of the universal basic income. That's a that's a basic uh, plan of the technocrats to have that to move into the cashless global type of situation where we have a global government and a global economy and all this stuff. I know there already is, or I know the dollars, I know all that, but I'm saying like a more intense thing um, that has been planned for a hundred years. So one of the things I do is what I call my globalism, a uh, globalism books talk where I do 40 plus lectures on 40 plus books uh, the, of the, of the elite of the last century. So we pick out um, the most important books of the elite, and we go through them one by one by one. Uh, one of those is so big, a 1300 page tragedy and hope. I had to do eight lectures just on that book. So there's actually, there's more like probably 50 or 60 lectures, but we cover Brzezinski. We cover CIA handlers and operatives. We cover um, big time geo strategists. Uh, we cover historians of the CFR, like Carol Quigley. We cover Rockefellers. We cover all these big name people, DARPA, yeah. uh, Rand Corporation. Um, so that's my approach to these questions is reading it from the big scale perspective. So I see the Karanka virus as fitting into a plan to move people into uh, technocracy. It's not going to be a technocracy tomorrow. It's part of these phases of moving people into those, those uh, kind of cashless, technocratic, you're gonna be run by AI, everything's gonna be tracked and traced, smart city, bubble city, nightmare. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm kind of bummed that this, you know, that right now I'm teaching remotely, so it's, I'm kind of bummed that I have to go teach a class. Well, you can have me back on sometime. I would, I would love to, Jason. This is this is interesting. I think that also you're just someone where I'm like, ah, oh, I have a topic and I can't find a good person for it. I feel like I could just run anything by it. So, um, so uh, people can find you. Uh, best place would be like like social media, I'm guessing, and your YouTube channel. That's under yeah, you, go to, you can go to jasonalysis.com and uh, I have a vast uh, four year archive of lectures, talks, interviews, um, all kinds of stuff. Like I said, we have the globalism books talks, which is 40 plus lectures of the time. I mean, you're getting basically a master's degree education for four ninety five a month. Um, I've got YouTube channel. Definitely follow me there. Two books. You can get signed copies of the website. Uh, my TV shows at, at uh, Gaia TV. It's called Hollywood Decoded. Uh, you can watch that full season of that TV show there. Um, yeah, and then I'm on Twitter, Instagram. Just search Jay Dyer, you'll find me. Yeah, and and JC, I don't. I think that it's pretty. 
uh, easy to say you're not for everybody, but for some people, you are like a great, great resource for getting information and analysis and stuff like that. I mean, it's esoteric, right? I mean, that's, that's, um, that's part of it. Sometimes. So, I mean, yeah. And then, and then like last night, a lot of people were mad cause I was acting like a complete idiot for two hours on a live stream, just having fun. And I'm like, come on, man. Like who you everybody's freak. I'm, I've been following the coronavirus since January. I'm, I'm so sick of reading about it and hearing about it that I had to just like, you know, talk about something else. So. No, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. But, um, but thank you so much for doing this and I thank look you. I'm honored to doing it again, Jason. Thank it was a great you. chat. All right.